There you go. I'm sorry. Live stream, I had you guys mute it. So you guys should be good to go now. <laughs> um, yeah, so we come together, like I was saying, we're coming, we come together as a church to celebrate our Lord Jesus, to celebrate what he has done for us and what he continues to do in our lives and to celebrate his return. And, um, you know, if you listen to the noise, it's not edifying. It's, it's discouragement. And we know that our Father in heaven does not sow discouragement. He's a God of encouragement and, and of love, right? So these are exciting times that we're living in today. The Lord may return while we're here worshiping him. That'd be so awesome. Be caught up in the middle of worship. Uh, we don't know. But we're called to live these lives that are just on fire for Jesus, on fire for the gospel. And that when we leave here after being refreshed in his holy presence, that his love just flows out of us and into our communities, into our circles of influence. And through us, he changes hearts. And I'm sure each and everybody that is sitting in here today has had their moment with Jesus Christ, their stone of remembrance. That no matter how hard things get um, today, um, you'll reflect back on where on where you met him on your road to Damascus. You know, where you were brought to your knees in a spirit of repentance, but also overwhelmed with his perfect, perfect love. So as we get started, I'm just go ahead and ask for you guys. Let's just stand together and, uh, and just reflect on the cross right now. Just reflect on Jesus, who he is. He's God. And he loved, he loved us so much that he came down from his throne to bear the punishment that we so deserved his great love for us because it pleased him he saved us like him, lion and the lamb, seated on the throne, mountains bow down, and every ocean roars, to the Lord of hosts, who is like him, lion and the lamb, seated on the throne, mountains bow down, Every ocean rolls to the Lord of hosts. Praise and delight from the rising of the sun to the end of every day. Praise and 
nations at your All the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise. Who is like him, lion and the lamb, seated on the throne? Mountains bow down, and every ocean roars to the Lord of hosts. Praise at the night, from the rising of the sun to the end of every day. Praise at the night, all the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise. From the rising of the sun to the end of every day, praise at night. All the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise at night. From the rising of the sun to the end of every day, praise at night. All the nations of the earth. The angels and the saints sing praise. Yes, Father, thank you, Father, for who you are. Thank you for your love, for your grace, your abundance of mercy. Let us not forget those things, Lord. Yes, you are a God of wrath, Lord, and you bore that wrath in our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, God. We love you. We welcome you here in our church, in our town, in our lives, Lord. May your word go forth powerfully. May we not sit idle as your church, Lord. You gave us specific instructions to go tell and tell the whole world, Lord. Let us not be comfortable, confined within these walls of the church. Lord, we need your courage, your strength, and your boldness, and your wisdom to go out and, and tell the world about how great you are. Freely pay. Your 
your love is deeper than any ocean higher than the heavens reaches beyond the stars in the Your love has no bounds. Your love is deeper than any ocean higher than the heavens reaches beyond the stars in the sky. Your love is deeper. Than any ocean higher than the heavens reaches beyond the stars in the sky. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love has no bounds. I saw this cool uh, little phrase the other day. You guys can have a seat if you want. If you want to continue to worship, worship as you feel led. And I saw this cool just phrase the other day. And this little placard and it said, live in grace. It said, live by grace, not perfection. And who here tries, strives for perfection and is exhausted? You know, that's not the life that Christ wants for us. Of course, he wants us to pursue him and in pursuing him makes you holy and sanctifies you. Don't do it on your own. It's a terrible idea. Let's draw close to God. Let's draw close to Jesus right now. His presence is here. We know the verse. Two or more, where is he at? Our Lord Jesus is right here with us. Our King is here with us. Let's get excited about that. That's exciting. Every time you or a brother or a sister are together, and we're in prayer and in fellowship, the creator of the universe, the one whose power holds the atoms together, puts the breath in your lungs, is in your midst. Who are we? But he loves us. That makes me feel good. That should make you feel good.
church. And Father, we just, we come before you. And not that you need us, Lord, but because you want us and you love us. You know, God, and uh, you know, we know we need to come with repentant hearts that are humble. I know myself and probably many of us need a lot of work, Lord. And we know that you have a, a wonderful will for our life and uh, Oftentimes, you could strive against it. But Lord, you never turn away from us. When we may feel we're a thousand miles away from you, um, we just look to the right and you're right there. Always to receive us, Lord, in celebration. And we thank you for that, Father. And you are a, a great and awesome and powerful and mighty mighty God and no matter what the enemy throws at your people your church will prevail that's what your word says Lord and so help us to be heaven minded Father help us to be uh, 
loving to our neighbors, uh, especially during these times, Father. Um, help us just to spread joy and cheer and encouragement. Empower us, Lord. We love you. Father, you are great. 
great. And you're awesome. Let's be reminded. Let's be reminded of his love for each and every one of us. Lord, just be in the presence of our church. Holy Spirit, fall upon our pastor as he begins, prepares to, to teach us, Lord, and share from your word. Prepare our hearts and our minds. May we leave here today changed, looking more like you, Jesus. In your holy name we pray, amen. All right, turn around and uh, greet your neighbor. My glasses are all foggy. That doesn't happen to you guys, right? Good morning. How are you guys doing? Turn your Bibles to uh, John chapter 8. Oh, I'm sorry, John chapter 7. Get my notes up here. Uh, you guys know all the stuff going on, Bible studies, whatnot, uh, Sunday. Pray for me because I'll have to make a decision in the next couple of days, what we're going to do next week, um, just kind of try to watch the briefings and stuff. So two weeks outside, hopefully we can go back in, but we'll see what happens next week. So just uh, got to try to make wise decisions at the same time, obey God and try to figure out how to strike the balance between God and government right now. It's not a, it's, it is a little difficult. So I do, to use a Christian term, I covet your prayers. Um, I do need them, you guys. It's big decisions to make. Um, so, um, and then tithes and offerings, all that stuff's all over there. You guys know where everything is. Let's stand. We're going to read verses 37 through 39. Just a couple verses. Three verses. In John chapter 7. John 7. We're working our way through the Gospel of John. We're kind of hovering in 7, and we, we did chapter 8 few weeks ago with the woman caught in adultery, but we're just kind of moving through, taking our time to get through the Gospel of John. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scriptures has said, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Uh, Father, I thank you today, and I praise you for your word. And uh, teach us today the significance of this day in history, when you stood up and declared that all who were thirsty could come to you and have their souls satisfied. Do a work in our hearts today. Help us know once again and on a deeper level your love for us and your desire to save us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat. I think I need to tilt my thing up. The glare is getting in my... Well, that's not good. Didn't have glare last week. Water. <clears throat> Water is essential for life. In fact, I forgot to get a bottle. Uh, a human being can go without food for about three weeks. But without water, one can only survive for about three or four days. Water is essential for the infrastructure of any uh, community, whether they be Bedouins out in the desert or citizens of a major city. 
In fact, many of you know, billions of dollars have been spent on the pursuit of finding water on Mars. For some reason, people have it in their mind that we need to go colonize Mars. Well, we can't do it unless we find water. And every time, they're just constantly looking for that. The colonizing of the red planet is something man wants to do, but without a sustained source of water, humans could never survive there. Listen, because water is essential for life, the Bible often uses the picture of thirst and quenching of thirst as spiritual illustrations for the human soul. In today's passage, Jesus will do just that. But as you will see, he goes much deeper than many ever really grasp. Now, I'm going to ask some questions at the beginning, and we'll go back to them towards the end. Uh, Are you thirsty for more of this life, or have you found true refreshment and quenching of your thirst in Christ? Are you satisfied with Jesus, or do you find yourself searching for fulfillment apart from Him? Now, I hope today that we can all be refreshed and refilled by the living waters of the Holy Spirit as we look at this passage. Friends, we need this now more than ever. Uh, This is a, a time in the history of the church that's unique. And it's not just here in San Pedro. It's all around the city, the county, the state, the country, and the world. I've got friends in Nepal that are asking for prayer because of COVID's health. You know, they can't have church, but they're thriving still. You, know, you, guys, you guys heard a big uh, major Bible teacher church up out, out in the valley. Said, they said this weekend they're defying the governor. Well, you know, the, the city just told them they're going to shut their power off if they gather for church. It'll be interesting to see the news later when we uh, finish up. It's a unique time in history, you guys. And really, the true grit of Christians is starting to come out. A little sandpaper is being applied to the church, wouldn't you say? But what is, what is the purpose of sandpaper? It's to make something smooth, to make something uh, beautiful, something that can be varnished and shined and look great when the work is done. That's what Jesus is doing right now with His church. He loves His church, but He wants His church to be strong. Jesus doesn't want a weak bride. He wants a bride that's strong and worthy of being married to a king. So a little pressure right now we're experiencing, but we need to be walking faithfully. And we need to start making some decisions where we're going to stand with Christ in the coming days and weeks. I'm not sure where this is going, but we're going to keep doing church as long as we can. Let me set the scene a little bit for our text, because it's just a couple of verses today, but really profound, to be honest with you. Jesus had told his brothers to go up to the Feast of Tabernacles without him. They had not believed in him, but they told him to go up. They're like, fine, if you're the Messiah and you're doing miracles here in the Galilee, that's great. We, we recognize you're a, a miracle worker, but if you're really the Messiah, then go on up to Jerusalem where everybody is. The thousands of people are there during the Feast of Tabernacle and prove that you're the Messiah. Well, Jesus is not about proving himself. Jesus is about saving souls and setting the captives free and casting out demons and healing the sick and, and, and uh, attending to those who have been wounded by religion. That's what he wants to do. He doesn't want to prove himself. He doesn't need to. Every time he opens his mouth and teaches the word of God, he proves himself. Those who are willing to believe As he just said in this passage, as the scriptures have said, they will find rest for their souls. So Jesus holds back. He said it wasn't the time to go up, but after a few days into the feast, he began to go, he did finally go up, and he began to teach there in the temple. Many came to faith, many believed in him, but the Pharisees, they hardened their hearts even more, and they continued plotting to kill him. But now, the Feast of Tabernacles is coming to an end. And Jesus has one last opportunity to share the gospel of the kingdom before the masses go home. So verse 37, on the last day, that great day of the feast. Note note those words. It's the last day, the great day, or the greatest day of the feast, some uh, versions may say. 
The Feast of Tabernacles, it lasted eight days. It, it begins and ends with a special Sabbath. The Lord had instituted the Feast of Tabernacles uh, back in the book of Exodus as a celebration of the final harvest of the year. And it, and it went deeper than that. The feast had several elements uh, co commemorating the promise that He had given His people in the wilderness that when they went into the promised land, uh, every year they were to gather for the Feast of Tabernacles. It's an eight-day feast, just celebrating and excited. They, they're like the harvest is done. Uh, they're, 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 they've given their tithes and their offerings and they're excited and they're just eating and drinking and worshiping the Lord. Uh, and, it, and it looked uh, to the time when the Lord had dwelt with them in, the, in their tent, in, in the tabernacle, and then He was there at the temple. But it looked forward, it was a prophetic feast that looked forward to the day when God Himself would come once again and dwell with His people Israel. And those who studied the Word of God, the Bible, and, and understood the Messianic prophecies knew that that meant the Messiah would come and He would sit upon the throne of Israel and dwell, establish His kingdom. That's what we refer to uh, from this side of prophecy as the millennial reign of Christ, where, where, where Christ will sit on the throne and reign for a thousand years upon this earth and Israel will be His nation that He has chosen to, to rule and sit from, but then, of course, the mystery of the church wasn't revealed yet in the Old Testament. We know now that we will be his co-heirs and his, those who rule and reign with him over the earth. But these, these feasts looked to that day as they looked back. And if you remember when we were back in Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, when we looked at uh, in Numbers, when we looked at these feasts, you remember that Jesus, God called them Holy what? Does anybody remember the word? Convocations. What does that word convocation mean? Solemn assembly, but really the idea behind that word convocation is a dress rehearsal. They, they were to celebrate these feasts, keeping the future in mind, keeping what God was going to do at the forefront of their memory. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles, now this is important though, okay, that what I just said. So the Feast of Tabernacles uh, was one of the three mandatory feasts for all males in Israel to attend and, of course, bring their families if they had them and if they possibly could. It was spent with great celebration, as I said. The, the people would dwell in booths or tents made from palm branches in remembrance of the tents that they lived in during the wilderness years. When the Messiah came, they would welcome Him. That was the idea. Well, the Messiah is there. At the time, uh, uh, at this time in the ministry of Jesus, many are coming to believe that He is indeed the Messiah. But there are others that are still in unbelief, His own brothers at this point. You know, we, and then the Pharisees, of course, are hardening. And if you read the rest of chapter 7, and we looked at this on our midweek study, there's just back and forth with the people. Some people are like, I, I believe. And other people are like, who is this guy? They're like, oh, well, wait a minute. Isn't the Messiah supposed to do this or that? There's all kinds of debates and controversies. But nevertheless, Jesus is still there. So the words that he utters on this day are so important for a believer and unbeliever to hear and understand. Verse 37 again, On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So it's on the last day of the feast, Jesus stands up in the temple court, and he loudly declares. It says he cries out. That word means with great passion. So he, he wasn't just like, hey, you know, can you hear me in the back there? I mean, he, they could hear him. He cried out with a loud voice. And he, he declared that all those who were thirsty, and they, of course he's speaking spiritually, they could be satisfied if they come to him, if they believe 
him, if they believe what he has taught, if they believe what the scriptures have said about the Messiah, and they believe that as he applies those scriptures to himself, that he is the Messiah, they would be satisfied. Now, these words that he spoke were vital to the mission and work of Jesus. And the understanding of his claim to save souls is important for us to understand. Let me tell you why. This was fascinating to me as well. You see, a big part of the, fellow, the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles, again, was the re- remembrance. We've got to wait for Mr. Motorcycle to head on out here. <clears throat> a big part of it was the remembrance of God's miraculous provision in the wilderness. Remember, God provided uh, everything they needed. In fact, in the book of Numbers, we read their shoes didn't even wear out for 40 years. I mean, God, God knows all of our needs. The shoes didn't wear out. I always laugh when I teach that because I like to play the guitar, but I'm not really that good. I cha- I've changed my guitar strings by probably 10 times or less in like 30 years. They just keep going all the time. I always laugh and chuckle because I, I don't even know if it sounds bad. I, you know, sometimes I do. I was like, oh, or if a string breaks. I be- I've only had a couple of strings break on me. So I, that's my little wilderness secret between me and the Lord. He just keeps my guitar going for all these years, you know, because he knows that I just don't understand those things. But what else did he provide in the wilderness? Manna, right? And Jesus, has he not already stood up and said, he is the manna? He is the bread from heaven. And you must come and partake of him. And then what else? Well, quail. Yeah, that was kind of a punishment, though. The people were complaining too much. So they had quail stuffed down their throat until they couldn't eat anymore. But water. Several times they came across water. The, the wells at Elam, the 12 wells that produced enough water uh, to take care of two or three million people. Uh, the times when they came where there was no water and they were panicking and freaking out uh, again. And then Moses was told to strike the rock and the water flowed out. Feast of Tabernacles specifically celebrated that event. You know, during that uh, in Exodus chapter 17, when Mo- God told Moses to take his staff and strike the rock, a fountain poured out and it provided abundantly for millions. In the time of Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles, they had added this element. Now, this is fascinating. Keep tracking with me. Uh, once a day for the first seven days of the feast, The priest and a big uh, procession would go down to the Pool of Siloam, which is one of of the springs that was just outside of the temple courts there. Uh, Solomon had, had put those together nice and beautiful. But they would take water from the Pool of Siloam in a golden pitcher. And then they would have a big processional and they would march it up to the temple. And when they got to the temple and when they got up to the brazen altar, they would pour the water out on the right side of the altar to remind everyone of God's miraculous provision of water during the time of the wilderness. On the evening of the seventh day, continuing on into the last day. Remember, the Sabbath started in the evening. So the, the evening of the seventh going into the eighth day, uh, on that day, they would not, not do the water. They would only offer up prayers for water. It was kind of a reenactment of how they had prayed and asked God to provide water for them. Do you get the picture? They, this, is, this last point now, they are just praying for water because so there's no water left. That's kind of the idea. The water is gone. What are we going to do? Now, in their minds, they're praying for the water as a remembrance of, of the wilderness, but they're also begging God and praying for God to bring the rain once again, the, two, the, the former and the latter rain, so that they will have two more successful harvests. There's a spring and a summer harvest there in Israel. So they are praying. Now, that last day of the great feast, and that's why John inserts this for us and 
ties up what Jesus says here. That last day of the great feast is called Hashanah or Rabbah. Hashanah Rabbah. It means the great salvation. Isn't that fascinating? They're praying and asking God to bring a great salvation for the nation. Now, politically at that time, Rome was occupying, you know, so, so they would you know, kind of add that to their prayers a little bit as well. You know, God, give us a great salvation. Give us the harvest. Give us the rains. But, you know, get the Romans out of here. We, need, we want redemption. So it was the, the Hashanah Rabbah, the great salvation. A series of poems and loud uh, prayers would call upon the Lord to rescue and redeem the Jewish people. The cry was for God to come and the Messiah to rule. Well, on the eighth day, the cycle of reading of the Torah reset back to Genesis as the people would focus once again on God's Word to sustain them. So I hope you see the significance here of why Jesus chose this day and this moment to cry out these words. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow Rivers of living water. As, as the people longed for the water to be poured out again, they were looking out to the next year. But Jesus was saying, no, right now. Come to me right now. And I will pour out waters. Rivers of living water will flow out of you if you come to me now. They, the people were crying out for salvation. And Jesus says, he is there to save the people are, are turning their focus back to the Word of God. And Jesus says, if you believe in me, as the Scriptures have said, you will not be thirsty anymore. Jesus, the Logos, the Word of God, stands in their midst and declares that the great salvation they seek is Him. The Scriptures have declared Him. Those who want to believe will read them and they will be convinced. When Jesus applied the scriptures to himself on that great day, he was bringing several messianic passages into focus. And, and uh, as John uh, had gone into earlier in the chapter, he is teaching. He's teaching the word of God. Uh, just a few passages that he probably uh, would teach. Isaiah 12. And in that day you will say, O Lord... I will praise you. Though you are angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, Yahweh, the Lord is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. What were they doing during this time? praising God and singing, thanking Him for the redemption of the past, looking for the redemption of the future. They had come back from the Babylonian captivity. The nation had been changed to a certain degree and not caught up in idolatry any longer, but they're still crying out for that major redemption. But Isaiah 12, 3 was one of the verses sung by the choir on the days they would bring the water pitcher up. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Isaiah 55, the prophet says, ho, that word ho, I always love that in the Bible, ho. It just means like, hey, look over here. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, Come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. This is God speaking to the nation. If you go back into Isaiah, this is the Messiah, the Messiah's words that he would speak to the nation of Israel. You guys, this is what Jesus is speaking that day in the temple. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. 
Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Right there, the, right there, the Messiah speaks in the Old Testament. The same uh, general theme of what Jesus stood up and spoke that day. Come to the waters, all who thirst. And by the way, there are many who try to choose who God saves or, or say that they know that God only chooses certain people to save. And, you know, we reject that, that viewpoint because too many times in the words of Jesus himself, he, he dies for all of the world. If the Son of Man be lifted up, you know, I will draw all men to myself. Right here, Jesus didn't say, you know, all those who are chosen, please show yourselves. No, he said, if anyone thirsts, what does he say in Isaiah 55? All who are thirsty, all who desire, come. Stop spending all your efforts on things in the world that will never satisfy. Come to me and eat and drink and be filled because I will save you. I will make a covenant with you. I will have mercy on you. Come and incline your ear to me, right? The word of God. Believe in the Messiah. Come incline your ear to me and you shall live. Your soul shall live. Isaiah 56 also though. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. You know, the Feast of Tabernacles also looked toward the fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 14 when the Messiah would step down onto the Mount of Olives. And if you go to Israel, you go up on the Temple Mount, you go over to the east wall, the eastern side, and you could see the Mount of Olives. Either the day before or the day after or sometimes that day on your tour, they will take you up to the top of the Mount of Olives. And you will stand there where Jesus will one day come and stand. And it looks down and he will walk through the eastern gate. Uh, but that prophecy, part of the prophecy of Zechariah 14 is when Jesus stands on the Mount of Olives, again, physically on the earth. This is after the Battle of Armageddon. It's not much of a battle. He just wipes out the devil and all, all the enemies. He will go to the Mount of Olives and he will stand on the Mount of Olives. And when he does, it will split in two and a great fountain will come bursting forth from underneath the Mount of Olives and it will run down to the west going through Jerusalem and a river once again will go through to Jerusalem. And that's uh, one of the prophecies in Psalm 46, by the way. There is a river whose streams make the people of God glad. Uh, it's looking to that day when that river once again runs through Jerusalem. And then the other side will run and it'll flow into the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea will once again be alive. It will no longer be called the Dead Sea. It'll have fish and everything in it going into the millennial reign of Christ. So as Jesus stands in the temple among thousands passing through, having hearts searching for God, because that's what people did. They, they came to search for God. Those three feasts every year, they would come and they would be searching for God. They, they should be. As he stands there, among hearts that are searching for salvation, he cries out that he is the salvation that they seek. That he is the living water, the rock from the wilderness. He is the Savior. He is the Redeemer of Israel, the Word of God that was given to the nation at Mount Sinai. My friends, Jesus is the only one that can satisfy Jesus is the only one that can keep living water flowing through the hearts and souls of those who believe in Him. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Have you received His salvation? Have you received this living water that He has offered? Remember the woman at the well? Same thing. She was desiring. And He told her, if you come to me and believe in me, I will give you living water. You'll never thirst again. Listen, Jesus declared that He's the Savior and that His Word, the Bible, which records every word of His, has everything we need to help us turn from sin 
and receive eternal life. No one needs search for satisfaction anywhere else but in God's Word and through Christ. Now, let's not forget something very important. We have a special added bonus today regarding the gift of salvation. We have the Holy Spirit who gives us a fuller understanding of salvation, unlike many of the people that day. See, John inserts for us here, verse 39, he wrote this uh, uh, many years later, uh, towards the end of his life, around 90 AD, he wrote these words. So he inserts for us verse 39, but this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. You see, Jesus would not be here on earth forever, because his mission was to die for the sin of the world, and then rise again to conquer death. Sadly, and this really moved me this week just thinking about this, the Feast of Tabernacles was the last feast that Jesus would celebrate on the earth. You see, He didn't celebrate Passover. He was full of anguish on Passover. Six months later would be Passover, the last one for Him. Not a lot of celebrating was going on with him when he was getting ready to die. When the people were celebrating, when they were eating their meals, uh, Jesus was hiding out with his disciples. When the people were sacrificing the lambs and thanking God for their salvation and God's redemption of the nation, Jesus was being scourged and beaten and mocked and dragged up to a hill outside of Jerusalem and crucified. So this is the last time that Jesus is able to celebrate with joy. And be a part of the festivities of the, uh, of the um, celebrations that God had put up. While Israel would celebrate, he would stand and declare, Oh, the celebration that you could have if you just come to me now. The, the fulfillment of that feast could have been fulfilled that day. But it still is future now. After his resurrection and ascension to heaven, it was then that the Holy Spirit would come and empower and indwell His church to continue the mission upon earth. On the day of Pentecost, the living water of Christ poured out into the believers as the church was formed. Don't forget, during all of the stuff that we're going through right now in the church, because it's, it's, it's weird, it's strange, it's different. And people are getting weird, if you notice. Just it's, it's interesting, things that are going on. Christian, do not forget, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. The church, uh, you are the church because the church dwells in you. Because Jesus ascended back up to heaven. At the time he spoke these words, he gave the offer, but he was not yet glorified yet so that salvation could be fully realized. But now it is. Now I asked those questions earlier, and this is where we make some application to our lives today. Are you thirsty for more of this life or have you found true refreshment and peace in Christ? Is Jesus enough for you? Are you satisfied with Jesus? Or do you find yourself searching for fulfillment apart from Him. You know, just bringing it to a more modern analogy. Uh, have you watched Netflix all, all together? Have you finished Netflix yet? I mean, is there any, are, you, are you bored enough yet to just turn back to Christ maybe a little bit more? I know I, know I, I have that in me where I'm just trying to find some kind of fulfillment because I'm bored. I can't get out. You know, you're not really supposed to be going out that much and doing all that kind of, it drives me nuts. You know, and going to the grocery store is just, you know, such a hassle now. It's, you know, and I won't put my mask on until I get up to the door. So you get those people in the parking lot that are coming out, you know, and they just got their evil stares at you. And it's like, you know, it's right here. And the other day we walked down to make a key and I was like, I'm not putting my mask on. I'll put it on when I get to the key shop, you know, but it's like, it's right here, you know, walking down the street. I'm, I'm 30 feet away from every car driving by, but you still see people looking at you. You really do. People are just looking at you. Yes, the mask police. <laughs> hey, there's a phone number to call. 
There is. That's why we need prayers, you guys. There's a phone number to call. If you, if you see a business violating the ordinances, I don't know. We, we see people drive by and stop and take pictures during the women's Bible study. People stop at the end of the driveway. I don't know. God's good. Listen, the teaching of Jesus was powerful and his passion was palpable. But his cry in this passage reveals the heart of God for his fallen creation. The Lord knows that men and women cannot survive spiritually without coming to the springs of living water that Jesus came to offer. So he sent his only begotten son to die for our sins. And for those who believe upon his name for their salvation, eternal life is secured. All the pursuits of this life to satisfy the thirst for life will eventually drain the wells and leave nothing behind. But Jesus offers an eternal flow of life for the thirsty soul. You know, the closing words of the book of Revelation echo the cry of Jesus on that day as they form the offer of life. This is, this is the final parting words of the Bible. You know, Jesus said this in the Gospel of John. You know, the middle of the New Testament. The, I showed you the Old Testament where God called people who were thirsty to come and be quenched and, and, and satisfied. But Jesus said, if you believe in me, as the Scriptures have said, right? The Scriptures weren't complete yet. But John would complete the Scriptures. These are the closing words, some of the closing words to the book of Revelation, which is the end of our Bible. John says, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. The, the water of life, the pure water of life, one day we will dwell in heaven, the new heaven and the new earth. And we will see the throne of God and we will see that water of life flowing out of the throne one day, and it feeds the trees that have the 12 fruits that are for the healing of the nations. For, for eternity, the tree of life will be available for all of us to eat, and we'll have the rivers of living water. And then in verse 17, this is Revelation 22, verse 17, and the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Isn't that wonderful to see the heart of God? You know, God's not sitting in the heavens, you know, punishing his church. Oh, you guys were doing things I didn't like. And oh, too many hypocrite Christians. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make, make you all, you know, decide if you're going to serve me or not. Yes, there's, there's some sifting going on, of course. But what is God's heart? Come, all who are thirsty. All who desire, the Spirit and the Bride. That's, that's the Holy Spirit says, "Come." The Bride of Christ says, "Come." Whoever hears the word of God says, "Come." Let it. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Have you truly come to the waters of life? As a final application, and this is for us now. It's worth noting that Jesus did not only speak of something just flowing into a person. Notice what he says. Something flows out. Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. The eternal life that Jesus offers, you guys, it's not just something we receive. It's also a source of blessing to be poured out to others. In other words, don't keep it to yourself. You have living water in you, and it's a flow. Notice that. It's flowing. It's not a pool. Jesus didn't give you a bottle to hold on for your life. It's a river. It's a spring bubbling up. Really, the, when the, the, the Greek is bubbling up. It's a spring. It's a constant source. You should be filling up bottles and pitchers and pails and going and dumping it on other people. That's your assignment this week. Go get a bucket of water and pour it on a sinner. 
and then give, give them a sermon illustration about how Jesus wants to satisfy them. There you go. I could just see that in the newspaper. They're not wearing masks at that church and they're pouring water on people. It's true, though. If a, river, if a river of living water is pouring, flowing into you and flowing out of you, others should be drinking. Others should be getting wet. Others should be getting satisfied and even more thirsty to come and see what this is about. See who Jesus is. See, see if there's satiation for their soul, for the thirst that they have, that they can't seem to quench in this world. Don't keep it all to yourself. Don't keep it all to yourself. Especially now. This is a time to be wise, but a time to preach. A time to share. A time to offer to others. Amen? Amen. Be encouraged. God loves you. He desires that you not be thirsty. He saved you, but He put His water in you to be poured out to others. That's pretty much we've squeezed <laughs> everything we can. We've wrung it all out. Now go and be filled. Go and have a good day. Pray for second service as they come in and pray for us this week as we decide what we're going to do next week. God is good. Father, I thank you and I praise you for your word. I thank you that you stood up on that day to make one of the greatest points on the greatest day of the feast. You made the greatest point that all mankind could ever know. That you offered living water to those who thirst. I pray that every one of us is satisfied with you and you are enough as we enjoy life and the abundance of life that you have given us and the joy of life that you have given us. We thank you for that, but I pray that each and every one of us would understand that our satisfaction comes from you and it's found in you, but in turn, as you fill us, let us pour out to others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, guys, blessings. Uh, have a good week. Follow the parking lot guys as they guide you and direct.